Welcome to part five of the Debris Monitoring Training Series. The series is designed to provide an overview of debris monitoring no matter the experience level. And the training is provided by the Public Assistance Training and Development Branch. This is video five of a six part series. Summary. In this video, we will be covering tower monitoring, loaded debris trucks, typical temporary debris site setup, monitoring health and safety, and handling of hazardous material. Tower monitoring. Debris monitors at a debris management site, also known as a DMS, are often referred to as tower or site monitors. Tower or site monitors are required at the DMS regardless of if the site is temporary or a permanent one. Depending on the setup of the DMS, a minimum of one tower or site monitor is required to document load quantities and verify that trucks are emptied. Additional tower or site monitors may be needed at exit locations to verify that trucks are emptied or at reduction, grinding, burning, chipping, etc. locations to document and verify production rates. Tower site monitors' primary duties are accurately measuring and documenting load hauling compartments prior to debris hauling, collecting and physically controlling load tickets, ensuring that all debris is removed from trucks at DMSs, monitoring DMS development and restoration, and overseeing debris reduction, grinding, burning, chipping, etc. In the picture on this slide, you can observe a tower on a scissor jack. Tower monitoring is very helpful in monitoring debris operations and a safe setup is crucial. You can observe that in the picture, safety measures are in place, including cones, and although not visible, there's also a stop sign to provide clear communication. This example highlights the importance of safety for employees, including the use of proper personal protective equipment, also known as PPE, and providing shade, as it can get quite hot at this height. We may occasionally deploy roving monitors to conduct reports as well. Loaded debris trucks. On the left-hand side of the screen, you can observe some examples of loaded trucks at different percentages. We have four examples of trucks with a tailgate loaded at 60%, 75%, 85%, and at 95%. You can also observe two examples of loaded trucks without a tailgate loaded at 85 and 75%. This visual can also be found in the FEMA Debris Monitoring Guide. One important thing to note is that a debris truck can only be considered 95% loaded if it contains chipped or mulched debris. Typically, we see about 90% debris loads for chipped or mulched debris after it leaves the debris management site. The way this usually works is that the debris is loaded into the truck. Once the truck is loaded, the load ticket is given to the truck driver, who will then drive the loaded truck to either a temporary debris site or a landfill. Temporary debris sites are used to help reduce both vegetative and construction debris. You might see construction debris, referred to as CND, which stands for construction and demolition. Vegetative debris is reduced via chipping, grinding, or burning. The vegetative chips, or ash, are then either spread or hauled to final disposal depending on local environmental codes. When a loaded truck goes to a temp site, it pulls in next to a tower or scissor lift. The tower monitor receives the ticket from the driver and then looks into the truck and estimates how full the truck is. Load calls are based on 5% intervals. Typical temporary debris site setup. On the slide, you can observe a diagram illustrating how a temporary debris management site should be set up. Some things to consider when it comes to debris management sites. All debris management sites, or DMSs, must be approved and properly permitted sites. This is a requirement regardless of whether the site is permanent or temporary. Permitting authority for debris management sites typically lies with the State Environmental Department and list of approved DMS can typically be obtained from the state through the Debris Task Force Leader. Permanent sites typically require a yearly permit, while temporary sites require permits for the duration of the debris operation. Improper layouts of debris management sites and disposal sites can present a variety of issues, including inadequate space may create health and safety risks, such as overly large debris piles 
that present a fire or collapse hazard, heavy machinery being forced to operate in tight quarters, and inadequate buffer space for activities such as burning and grinding. Lack of controlled and monitored ingress and egress points for trucks makes it difficult to confirm that trucks and trailers are fully unloaded prior to exiting the facility. Lack of clearly defined separated areas for the handling of any hazardous materials, such as household hazardous waste, HHW, may present environmental compliance issues. If the site is not of sufficient size and well organized, efficient operation of the site will be difficult, potentially increasing the cost of operating the site. Operation of debris management sites or DMSs must include environmental monitoring activities necessary to comply with applicable federal, state, and local environmental laws and regulations, such as periodic air and soil sampling. Applicant debris monitoring activities must include adequate monitoring of any debris processing, reduction, or recycling activities that occur at the site, such as burning, grinding, shredding, and compaction activities. Applicant monitoring activities must be appropriate for the activity. For example, for a time and material contract for operation of a tub grinder, applicant monitoring personnel must conduct adequate monitoring to ensure the accuracy of labor hours and equipment usage claimed by the contractor. One thing to note is that this picture shows the reality that there is one entrance and one exit. That's it. One way in, one way out. It is important to review the debris management site guidelines and additional information can be found in the FEMA debris management guide that may be helpful to those involved in setting up debris management sites. Monitoring health and safety. Debris monitoring personnel should understand the typical hazards associated with debris monitoring activities and be able to effectively identify potential hazards in the field. Debris monitoring personnel have primary responsibility for their individual health and safety and must comply with all applicable federal health and safety requirements, including guidance on hazard identification, hazard controls, personal protective equipment, and health and safety incident management procedures. Examples of potential hazards include isolated areas in the areas with difficult access, heavy machinery, loud equipment and traffic, limited communication, extreme weather, cuts, abrasions, and punctures, slips, trips, and falls, personal security issues such as high crime areas or threats by debris contractors, and animals, insects, and plants. Debris monitoring personnel should be knowledgeable of the appropriate hazard controls that can be implemented to reduce hazards to the lowest practical level. Examples of hazard control measures relevant to debris monitoring activities include avoiding traveling alone to remote areas or areas that present a personal safety risk, establishing a regular communication schedule to keep track of the locations and status of debris monitoring personnel, carrying sufficient water and scheduling regular rest periods in extreme heat, avoiding walking on or touching disaster debris if possible, Observing posted safety warnings and traffic signs at debris management sites, DMS, and disposal sites. Obtaining and using appropriate personal protective equipment such as eye protection, hearing protection, head protection, respiratory protection, and personal visibility. Debris monitoring personnel should be knowledgeable in federal procedures for managing health and safety incidents so that immediate and appropriate action can be taken in the event of an accident. The state applicant and debris removal contractors are responsible for the health and safety of their respective personnel. However, the personnel may also be required to comply with applicable FEMA health and safety requirements for debris monitoring activities. Handling of hazardous materials. The handling of any hazardous materials at debris management sites or disposal sites, such as household hazardous waste, must comply with applicable federal, state, tribe, territory, or local laws and regulations. Is the disposal facility or site permitted to accept hazardous materials? In the case of an existing disposal facility that is permitted to accept hazardous materials, there may be less potential for issues because hazardous materials are normally accepted at the facility and there should be established compliant procedures in place. However, 
issues may still arise. In the case of debris management sites or disposal sites with temporary permits or waivers to handle hazardous materials, there may be a greater potential for issues such as improper segregation of hazardous materials from other debris types or inadequate containment measures. For example, lack of aligned area for surface runoff control for the temporary storage of HHW. Hazardous controls and PPE are also part of debris removal operations and are eligible supplies, provided they are reasonable in quantity. For instance, while having backup chainsaws is acceptable, purchasing an excessive amount for a small workforce may not be justified. It's essential to maintain a balance to avoid stockpiling unnecessary equipment. Separating hazardous waste is vital, including items like propane tanks and recyclable material. Identifying the source of these materials and any potential recycling proceeds is important. If recycling efforts yield small values, such as two or three hundred dollars, please document that as well. The key takeaway is to ensure that any facility handling hazardous material is permitted for that type of waste. Collaborate with local environmental officers to confirm that landfills are EPA certified for specific debris types, including hazardous waste. Fraud risk reduction information. For more information on the highest observed fraud risk to PA emergency work grant funds with respect to Category A, watch the video titled Category A Debris Removal Fraud Risk Profile. This video can be found by searching Fraud Risk Profile on YouTube. Now we have some closing information for you. To report corruption, waste, fraud, abuse, mismanagement, and or misconduct, contact the Department of Homeland Security Office of Inspector General by phone at 1-800-323-8603 or via the mailing address listed on the screen now. Procurement requirements are among the most complicated parts of the PA grant process, and noncompliance can result in de-obligation of funding. Please make sure that you are following FEMA's procurement guidance for recipients and subrecipients. Federal requirements for procurement and contracting are described in 2 CFR Part 200. The Procurement Disaster Assistance Team, or PDAT, offers some training and tools on their website at www.fema.gov slash grants slash procurement. For technical assistance with Grants Portal or Grants Manager, you can call the PA Grants Portal Grants Manager hotline at 866-337-8448. National hours of operation are 8 a.m. through 6 p.m. Eastern Time, Monday through Friday. The hotline can also be reached by email at FEMA-Recovery-PA-Grants at FEMA.DHS.gov. We have many other recorded webinars and tutorial videos available on our YouTube channel. You can find them by searching for FEMA Grants Portal on YouTube or by navigating to the Support Center in Grants Portal or Grants Manager. Thank you for watching.